This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Why Is Everyone Yelling? with Lindsay Hine. I am your host, Lindsay. I'm so grateful you're here today. I don't know if everybody's yelling at your house, but I just posted on Instagram that my kids were running around the house like unleashed animals. And then I thought, maybe that's really beautiful. What would I feel like if I felt like an unleashed animal? I think that's why I run. I think that's when I most feel like that. Anyway, today's episode of the podcast is with Aaron Mooring. This is episode 66, and Aaron is someone that I have followed online for a long time. Um, her Instagram name is Home with the Boys, and she has three sons who are a little bit older than my own. Let's see, she has a sophomore, an eighth grader, and a fourth grader. So I had lots of questions for her as she is quite a few little steps ahead of me in the parenting game. Erin is also a runner, so it was fun to hear that part of her story. And she shares with us a little bit about a project that she founded and work that she did for 12 years and finally decided it was time to step away and what that looks like to step away from something even when it's still a really good thing. She really encouraged me to step into what I'm passionate about, what I believe in, and to trust my own instincts for how to raise my family. A resounding message in this conversation is that your family is your family. Do it your way. I think I'm going to have Erin back on the show. She was just so great to talk to. I think you guys are going to love her. If you do love her and this podcast... Head over to iTunes and leave us a quick rating and review so that potential new listeners can find us. That is just so, so helpful in potential new listeners finding us. Did I say that? So helpful in potential new listeners finding us. I feel like I've said that for five years straight across these podcast networks. Uh, This show is part of the Sandy Boy Productions podcast network. Check out all of the shows in our network when you go to sandyboyproductions.com. Friends, enjoy my conversation with Erin Maureen. Well, today on Why Is Everyone Yelling? We have Erin Maureen on the show. Welcome to the show, Erin. Hey, great to be here. So excited to talk with you. I've followed you on Instagram and Twitter for a while now, so it's fun to connect on the podcast. Yeah, I feel like this um, major kinship with you because of the House of Boys. (laughs) Um, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, she gets it. It's yeah. like, <laughs> it's a very yeah. good feeling to talk to someone else in the same shoes. It really is. It really is because I grew up with a sister and honestly, my husband only had a sister too. And here we are raising three boys and it's just a different world. It totally different. I mean, same. I have two sisters and my husband has three sisters and my husband's not really like a super rowdy kind of guy and so all four of the boys it's just like so much testosterone here um we had the same experience because I was like I did not ever see that side of my husband until the third boy came along yeah. and all of a sudden the whole house is nuts yeah. like <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> and I remember, I mean, looking back, because I sometimes get so frustrated um, right before bedtime because my husband will like, you know, get out, get down hands and knees and like all the kids will pile up and everybody will wrestle, get them riled up right before bedtime. But I look back and I'm like, actually, I remember doing that with my dad too, like me and my sisters, you know? Yeah. 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 It's just, it is a different level with the boys, but you know, I also appreciate the fact that I know my sister and I would fight over things and hold a grudge for like, yeah. you know, a month yeah. over somebody taking a shirt from somebody's closet or something like that. And they seem to move on very quickly from the fights they have. They might be super intense. Yeah. And physical. <laughs> for yeah. like an hour. <laughs> yeah. Very physical. Uh, but they, yeah, it's like, eh, it's whatever. It wasn't like, it wasn't anything personal. It was like that happened right. then and now we're, we've moved on. Exactly. Exactly. 
Um, so you also are a runner, which is fun. I love kind of combining yes. my two passions. You know, I host the running podcast as well. And I know you which mentioned. I love. I love your running podcast too. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an interesting transition, like starting this show too, and kind of like keeping them separate, but also at the same time on the running podcast, I talk mom stuff sometimes and vice versa over here. So, um, it's nice to, for them to both have their homes, but I noticed that right. you started running after your third baby. And I think that that's super interesting. And, you know, a lot of times after you have your babies, it's like, I want to pick up something for myself, something new and also have an outlet. So talk to us about how you found running after your third baby. Yeah. So, um, in all honesty, I hated running like most of my life, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, that kid in elementary school, that's like sandbagging the mile, yeah. you know, like I, I don't want to do this. Why are you making me do this? I'm just going to walk it. That type <laughs> of thing. Um, I grew up uh, playing tennis and I, I played a few sports and stuff like that, but we were a, we were a tennis family, but running, no thanks, like no interest in that at all. Um, and I actually tried to do the whole couch to 5k thing with a friend because she brought it up and this was after we had two kids and uh, we started and got about like five or six weeks in and really just doing it to like spend time with her. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we got five or six weeks into it and I got pregnant with our third and I was just exhausted and not feeling great. And it quickly went out the door because it was not a priority to me yet. So, um, my husband was also in medical school at the time, so his schedule was nuts. So trying to find time to work out when I wasn't feeling great and pregnant and had two other kids and he had a crazy schedule. So that just didn't happen. But the interesting thing is during his fourth year of medical school, then while I was pregnant with our third, he decided he wanted to be a healthier example for his future patients. So he started running that January while I was still pregnant and he just instantly kind of fell in love with it. He lost 40 to 50 pounds. Oh, wow. He within two months, he was doing his first race, which was a 10 mile race, which who does a 10 mile for their first race? <laughs> right. <laughs> But that just shows you that it really like caught on for him. And that was infectious for me. Like I just was like, oh, if, if he loves this and can do this, I can do this too. And I think the fact that I had done Couch to 5K before getting pregnant, even just a little bit of it, mm -hmm. was enough of a seed to say, I can do this. And he's doing it. I can do this. So uh, I got medically cleared six weeks after having number three. And you're right, it was kind of that my own time, you know, um, I never really did the running stroller thing. Um, we had a treadmill because we live in Nebraska. And if you want to run year round, that's pretty important. And um, I just found time when people were napping or whatever. And any chance that I could run outside and he was home, he would say, go and, and run. And um, I think it was that combination of needing something for myself, a little bit of an escape and the endorphins you get from that. Like that was really important. We also had just moved somewhere new. So, you know, I was feeling kind of alone and homeschooling. And so sometime out with nobody needing anything from me was really important. And um, I wouldn't say I loved it right away, but it was enough of what I needed at the time that it stuck. And I ran my, I ran a 5k that summer, and then a 10k and then a 15k. And nine months after he was born, I ran my first half marathon and it, it, it stuck from there. And I, I could honestly say by that point that I really loved it and needed it in my day. Um, I love that your husband chose to start running to set an example for his patients. What kind of doctor is he? He's an internal medicine physician. So okay. we always say it's like a family doctor without kids yeah, and yeah. pregnant women. Yeah. So he kind of, he does clinic stuff and um, he also does administrative stuff, but you know, he is in the clinic, has a relationship with patients and loves, uh, counseling them on healthy living overall, you know, finding something that you love 
that's active to keep yourself healthy and all of that. And he can tell them their story. Like you may not fall in love with running, but I did. And you need to find something that you at least somewhat enjoy doing that you'll keep up with that will keep you healthy. It's so good. And I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this so much over the past year, just like as a culture and society, like we just, everybody needs to get moving. Like, I don't care what it is. Like everybody needs to move 30 minutes a day and we need this like public outcry that like get moving so that we can be a healthier, healthier society. And I was thinking about it. Um, and when I was out for my run and like, I'm not just doing this you know, to set an example for the people around me or my kids, though, I am doing this so I can show up and have energy to be a good mom, to run this podcast, to do all the things I want to do. And it's like your husband chose to start running to set that example. But I'm sure that like it's paid off in so many millions of ways in his own life so he can show up in a better way. Right. And um I think we have to stop treating that movement as like a punishment and think of it more as taking care of yourself because moving actually relieves stress and it, it releases endorphins. It helps your body be healthier. It wakes you up like all of those things. And so I think you're exactly right. Like we need to stop like prescribing it as a punishment for like not being healthy and think of it more as like, this is something I get to do and reward myself with and I will feel better after it. And I, like you said, I'll be able to show up. I always tell the kids like, I don't want to get out of bed in the morning (laughs) and get on the treadmill. Like it's not that I'm like this supernatural person that is like so motivated and joyful about running that I can't wait to step out there. Like that's not, it looks like that to them because we consistently show up and do it, but it's the promise of what I will feel like after I've done it that actually gets me on there. And so you have to find that thing of like, I know what I will feel like when I've done this and I know how much better I will be in all areas of my life for it. And that's the motivation you need. Yeah. It's like, we have to remember that promise because it's not always easy (laughs) and remember like, I mean, I think just like actually saying this is a gift that I'm giving myself, even if it's hard sometimes like this, this, I get to do this. Um, You know, it's interesting though, and I'm curious your take on this raising kids because we set the example, we live this active lifestyle, but how have you approached, and especially so for everybody listening, Aaron's kids, what do you have a sophomore, a freshman and a sixth grader, fifth grader? Uh, Sophomore, eighth grade. And fourth grade. So we are in high school, middle school, and elementary school. Oh, all over the place. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. These last two years, um, my email inbox is like (laughs) nuts because I have three schools contacting me about everything. Um, So, yeah, we're spanning spanning all three schools. Um, Yeah, it's really interesting approaching it with kids, especially as they get older. I felt like it was easier when they were younger to be like, hey, come run with me for a mile. And it was like, oh, yay, you know, exciting. But they get busier and, you know, they get more independent and their own ideas of things. And so that well, what we were just talking about has been really important in motivating them to move is to say, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do today, but you need to do some kind of movement. And that's been kind of our theme over this break. And you know, during the school year, we got to be flexible with it because, you know, our oldest is in band, marching band, choir, show choir, like lots of stuff going on, youth group and, and all these things. And he doesn't always have time. He's got a lot of homework and, and stuff like that, but show choir is very active, Yeah, you know, so he's doing that. And, but over the break, we were getting back to that kind of like, this is stuff that will just make you able to show up for your life better in general or what's your, what are your goals in like in how you feel and all of that and how can you do that but honestly having that approach of I'm not going to tell you how to move your body today but it you need to for 30 minutes like yeah. and that's kind of an expectation especially on these breaks and on the weekends that's what we're trying to focus on with these busy weeknights and all of that um I will tell you, I know you wanted to talk about this, 
the Peloton has helped <laughs> a lot in our family. And I know I will say right up front, it's not doable for everyone. I know there's, you know, ex- expense issues yes, yes. and all of that stuff. But honestly, um, getting the Peloton and having a broad range of workout options for them has been huge. So yesterday, for example, uh, you know, we said 30 minutes of working out. One kid chose to do a 30 minute ride um, on the bike. Uh, One kid chose to do 30 minutes of strength. And one kid chose to do 30 minutes of yoga. And it was like, you know, and they had all those options to do classes on there with that. The day before, one of them did a run on the treadmill with an instructor on Peloton. So like they, it's not a prescriptive, you have to do this every day because I know that me telling them that they're going to hate it. Yeah. Then, you know, and that's not what we want. We want them to find ways they love to move and that make them feel what we feel when we run or um, whatever. And uh, giving them that freedom, I think, is part of it. You know, uh, our youngest uh, loves to swim, like swim laps. Mm. And so he got to go with dad to swim laps the other day and he can't wait to go again. So, you know, having options and exploring what kind of fills that bucket for them, but also gets them moving has been, I mean, that's just such a big thing in our family. You know, we can't force them to be runners because we like to run. Yes, exactly. (laughs) They all, they all do run. Our oldest has done three half marathons and that's intense. Yeah. And they've all done up to 5k and, um, middle one has done some 10ks. So they've all done that and explored that, but we also have to look like what's reality with our schedule And what do they want to be doing and kind of marry those together. And right now that's not running a ton, but they are, they are moving their bodies and that's, that's what's important. You know, I cannot get my kids to run with me and like, I (laughs) I don't try that hard, but a lot of times, which yesterday was amazing. um, I went for a five mile run and my second son, who's almost seven He's like, can I come with? I'm like, of course you can come with on his bike. And so he he biked like four of the five miles with me. And it was, there's nothing I love more than that. Like it is so good. I agree. But I can't get them to run with me. And my oldest son just ran a 7-12 mile at the presidential physical fitness thing at school. And I'm like, I don't think I could get him to run a 10 minute mile with me. So it's just... (laughs) Also funny, like if you remove yourself from the situation and let him explore it without your direction, how much more they might actually explore with like that. He doesn't want me to tell him, go run a mile as fast as you can. And not that I care how fast he runs it. I was just kind of blown away. Like, I can't believe you worked that hard for seven minutes and 12 seconds. (laughs) Yes. I always said this, especially with our oldest. And I think I'm an oldest child, too. So I get it. But we, when he was little, we did like the parent child swim class. Yeah. Yeah. You always do that with your first. Yes. And he wouldn't do like anything while I was there. And then the next year I put him in just regular ones and he's like under the water and doing, you know, like all this stuff. And I'm like, what? (laughs) It's removing myself. apparently. Like if I don't tell them to do it, they're going to want to do it. (laughs) It's kind of one of those things too. I think about this. I always wonder if I, um, like wuss out a little bit more in like a running workout if my husband's with me like because I find comfort in him being next to me like mm. oh this hurts too bad you know and I'm like maybe the kids feel like that too like mom's right here you know what yeah, I mean that is that is hmm. I like that philosophy that thinking <laughs> yeah but it really is about them owning it themselves yeah and so um, I feel like that's why we see you know I grew up in um in the tennis world and my sister did uh, college tennis and volleyball. So she was really into the athletics and everything. And I saw other people around her in that world burning out really fast Mm -hmm. because they were doing it because their parents were making them. Yeah. And they hated it really fast. And you could tell when they were on the court, you know? Um, And so that's why I advocate like, we're not pushing them into any sports. It's like, what do you want to do? What do you love? And if you don't love it anymore, let's find another way to, you know, to do that because I don't want you doing something because you're forced into it because you're just going to hate it then. Yeah. And I think, 
I think keeping the word like exercise out of the vocabulary mm. is super important too. Like, mm. um, we were created to move like your body, you were made to move your body. And that's, yep. that's what I try to focus on. Yeah. Hey friends, a quick break here to let you know about beam. Ever since I became a mom, actually probably even before that, I've had some sleep issues. I have a little bit of insomnia going on, especially at certain points in my cycle. One of the products I have found to love that helps me sleep better at night is the Dream Nighttime Powder. It's like a delicious, healthy hot chocolate, and it helps with shut eye, which is very important. It provides my body and it can provide your body with sleep enhancing vitamins and minerals such as magnesium and it also has nano hemp in it. These products are clean, they're effective and it's just like a really good nighttime ritual. If you're a runner like me or you like to work out and you get real sweaty, I would also check out their hydration line. I love their recovery blend. It is a post-workout drink that has electrolytes in it. It has this like fresh lemon taste. It's so delicious. I look forward to it. One of those things where, you know, you're in the middle of like a really hot, sweaty run and you can think about what you're going to look forward to when you finish. And I always look forward to this. It's so good. You all can save when you go to Beam, B-E-A-M, organics.com. Use the code Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-1-5, and that'll save you 15% off your order. All right, friends, back to the show. Okay, talk to me, though, about all these extracurriculars because you've entered a phase where, like, your kids you know, like they, they know what they, they love to do. Mm -hmm. They have these options and I'm kind of just now getting there. And I've always been really nervous to do too much because I don't want to be overscheduled. But at some point with so many kids, like you're going to have a lot on your plate. How do you handle that? Yeah, we have really hit that in the past year, especially. And I will tell you that this whole having a pandemic hit the first year of high school for our oldest I think we maybe had it a little bit, um, a little bit easier of a transition Uh. because there wasn't as much going on his freshman year. So this year feels like a sledgehammer (laughs) of activities, partially because things are opening back up and, and happening more normally, quote unquote. Um, but also because our youngest who's in fourth grade, a bunch of stuff has opened up for him as well. And I will tell you that Our oldest um, is really involved in music, both band and chorus. That is what my husband and I both majored in in college. And so this is like our world and we Mm. get it. Mm -hmm. And, and so that is fun, but he does have like, especially during marching man season, he had something like every single night. And that was, that was a big adjustment show choir, marching band, youth group, football games. I mean, it was just one thing after another. Our, our middle one is in band and jazz band, but his schedule is not quite as full yet because he's still in middle school. But we have had nights where we've had to split for concerts or, you know, that type of thing. And now our youngest is the type that's in everything that he can be in, possibly, <laughs> that involves people because he wants to be with people all the time. Oh, I love that. <laughs> he's very active. He's very social. So this year has opened up basketball uh, student council, uh, th- you know, just a, a full list of things. So this year has, um, my calendar is very, very full. Um, and we do have to split quite often to get to everything. Um, thankfully basketball games and show choir seem to that we're entering. So show choir season of competitions and we're still in basketball season all on Saturdays, <laughs> but thankfully Looking at our calendar, I think we can both make it to both things throughout this year, but it takes a lot of juggling. And I will tell you, we protected our schedule a lot um, up to this point, but there does become a point when there's three kids doing even the minimum of what they want to be doing, it's going to be busy. And um, my husband said this when we were looking at our calendars heading back from Christmas break. He said, we just have to see this as our new normal mm. and not 
not that uh, we don't have any family time. There is family time built in there as well. But the fact that every Saturday is booked on here, here on out, like that's just normal. It's nothing to panic about. It's just, this is how we are operating and moving forward and also doing what works best for our family. You know, like with show choir competitions, they perform during the day, but then they make finals and perform at night again. And maybe that's not doable for us to be at both. You know, maybe we're just going to the finals Mm. or something like that. Some families it might work to go to both and be there all day. And I think that comes down to assessing your family and your time commitments and everything and saying what is best for us, not what is every other family doing that's in this group. Yeah, that's so good. How do you like process making time to like have days where there's nothing going on? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're accepting the new normal, but like, yeah. When do you find rest when you feel overscheduled? Um, you know, I mean, sitting down with a family and saying like, I noticed this week that Tuesday night we have nothing going on. So don't ask to go anywhere. <laughs> like, you know, I Set mean, that I, expectation. Yeah. Like, like looking at these times and also, I mean, we also just have to understand that they're at this age as they're only getting older and busier and more independent, which is maybe the hard for me to process is like, they have more things they want to do on their own Mm -hmm. as they get older. And I have to like, that's natural. It's hard for me as a mom, but it's natural that there's this letting go process where they're going to want to be with friends more or need to go work and have a job or um, get done with a competition and not want to go out to dinner with the family, but go hang out with friends. Um, So finding just some peace in that if there's four of us home instead of five or three of us, or if I get some time alone watching a Hallmark movie um, while everybody's off doing stuff, that might be my rest for the week. And, and that's, that's what it looks like. We really do love watching family uh, movies as a family. And so that's something we kind of like look forward to and might schedule in like, Hey, Tuesday night, nobody has anything. We're going to see the Spider-Man movie together, you know, that type of thing. And everybody loves that. And so maybe making that, those things that your family loves to do together, a thing on the calendar that's scheduled. So it looks like that time is full, but it is, it is rest. It is connection. It is something that brings you all together in the midst of a crazy week. Um, So I am like, so sitting in this place where I'm like I even though my youngest is three I feel like I'm transitioning to big kid life because my oldest is nine yeah. and I don't know it just kind of feels like that you know we're not doing babies anymore and so you're a few steps ahead of me a few big steps I would say you know with a high schooler and a middle schooler yeah. um talk to me about like accepting that transition and owning like where you are knowing that like gosh I have like you know seven more years with my kids at home with the last yeah. one here. Yeah. Um, maybe you should talk to somebody else because I'm not <laughs> handling it well. <laughs> no. Um, honestly, I, I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, it is really, um, it's just a strange world to be in because I really do love our time as a family so much. Um, and I love when we do things together. We love to travel together. We love you know, I love the times where somebody says, Hey, listen to this song. And we all stop and listen to that. I I've tried to hold really tightly to our Friday pizza and movie nights and, and things like that. But especially as our oldest gets older and he, he has a girlfriend and he has a friend group and everything. And, um, I have, I think I've had to really think back to myself at that age and think, this is totally what I was doing at yeah. the time. This is normal. Um, and it makes me cherish the time that we all have together at home more and be more intentional with, hey, when you're home, you got to be present with us and talk with us and all of that. And in turn, we are letting you go off and be with friends and miss this, you know, night where we're hanging out and all of that. Um, but when you're home, we need to be able to connect and not be 
glued to screens, you know, in your room alone, things like that. Uh, and that that's helping me better is connecting in the time we have and not lamenting what we don't have. And then also, I have to think, I mean, we have two and a half years before he goes off to college. Mm. And I want him to be able to go out and function on his own, like, be out making decisions like with friends and all of that. Because if he's home all the time right now, he doesn't get to practice that and doesn't get to come back to a safe environment and process what's going on and and talk to a parent. You know, once he's in college, he's going out with friends and coming back to a dorm room and, and, and doesn't have that as much. So I am trying really hard to focus on connecting while they're home and not lamenting the idea that they don't always want to be home and recognizing that that's normal. Yeah, it's so true. That's such a good perspective too. Like this is their practice time. Yeah. And I'm sure, I don't know if you felt this too, but like, here's an example. I was like at the park, I don't know, a couple months ago with my kids and uh, there was all these brand, you know, new moms. I could tell they were kind of following their toddlers around. It was very new mom feeling. And I think they could probably see my big two kids and not necessarily my little two. And I just felt like they felt so like they probably felt like I was so far removed from them. And Mm -hmm. I just wanted to like squeeze them and say, I'm you too. Like I'm not, you know what I mean? Like this feels even though you, the time of having babies and toddlers feels distant, like I'm still me, you know, like, and sometimes I think that that's what I struggle with a lot as a mom, like as I'm moving on to this next stage, like feeling like I'm not relatable to those younger moms Mm, or I don't know. It's so weird. I I think there was this, um, I think there's this problem in mom relationships and cultures where, we think that because we're in a different stage, like, oh, it's easier for them now. They don't remember how hard this was or whatever. And one of the things I've always said when someone says, oh, it, 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 it gets easier, doesn't it? And I'm like, it gets different. Yeah. It doesn't get easier. Um, it gets different. I am less physically exhausted <laughs> as yeah. a mom now, but parenting teenagers is emotionally exhausting. Mm. And, um, it, it, and so I don't even, I don't want to say it gets harder either. I just, it's different. It's a different kind of, um, energy that it takes up as a mom. And so I feel like we had this, uh, when I was younger, I would have older moms saying, oh, it gets easier. Oh, you'll miss these times. Or, you know, like those kinds of phrases are not really helpful in bridging the gap. Mm. I think it's more helpful to say, Hey, um, it gets different and you'll be okay. And, uh, and, and that's, and we're still in the same thing. We're still trying to protect our kids. We're still trying to make them feel loved. We're trying to keep them, you know, connected to their family. That's a mom's goal all the way through. It just looks way different as they get older. I know I still moms still say to me like, oh, you're in it. I remember those days. And it's so funny because I already feel like I'm not in it like I was like, you know, like with a three year old hands on physically in it. Yeah. And like I don't have a newborn like crying in the middle of the night, you know. Yeah. Kids still get up, but it's totally different. Like putting a three year old back to bed than like soothing a baby, you know. Yes, very, very much. And it's not the crying baby keeping me up anymore. But I do wake up in the night and start thinking about social media issues yes. or friendships or things like that. And those are the things that keep me awake now. <laughs> um, let me ask you about that. Um, well, I'm so curious. Do you give your kid, what age do you let your kids have phones or social media? Um, so our oldest got a phone at the end of eighth grade. Okay. And, um, after about six months, we let him have Instagram. Okay. Funny enough, it was because we post our workouts. Well, we used to do it more, but um, my husband and I both would have, we love the running community on Instagram. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Um, and that's why he wanted it. It was to do that. And it's not quite as much that anymore, um, but that's the only social media he has right now. Um, and I'm fine with that. Um, I, the note, he doesn't want Facebook or Twitter, which 
I don't really want Facebook or <laughs> Facebook very often anymore either. But um, and we have just a hard no on Snapchat and TikTok for our house, and <sighs> that's just our family rules. And um, that has been that has been okay. I honestly think the thing that's the most different for me is the fact that they can text each other at any time of day. Any, you know, he plugs his phone in in our room at night. Okay. So yeah. I shouldn't say any time of day, but that is what's so different for me thinking back to my experience growing up to raising kids now is the fact that they are accessible. They can tell each other what they're thinking at all the time with text and have these ongoing conversations. And uh, I think that and the management of how much time they're using it Mm -hmm. have been the biggest struggles for us. Um, Social media, we just have said, this is what you get. (laughs) And that, um, but the time and the uh, instant access to everybody all the time is, is the thing we have to have the most conversations about. Yeah, that, I think that's what scares me the most is like the constant in the constant access to people. Yeah. And also just like, I mean, they don't really, the news doesn't matter as much to them. I mean, that's just like a problem in the cult, our culture in general, right, like right. our constant, like being fed everything all the time. Yes. But yeah, yeah, like when we were kids and we were away from our friends, we had breaks from our friends. We couldn't right. like check in and see what they were doing. Yeah. And we were home and then we'd see them at school or when we had, you know, run around the neighborhood or whatever, but they don't have breaks anymore. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's very different. And, and I will, I will say we honestly, even though we text people, we have a different concept of that. Like, like we could text a friend and be like, fine that they don't text back for a few hours because we don't need that instant yeah. communication and that is a different world for our our high schooler is like if you text someone you expect something back right away and like I can't stop this conversation because it's almost like talking on the phone to them yeah it's so interesting I I, I don't know you and I are probably close in age but I remember I got a flip phone in high school yeah but it wasn't like on all the time or like you right. know like you didn't you never got it out in class or and you never thought about anything like that and it was like I don't know I don't even remember like using it that much yeah I got my first one in college like yeah. a year or two into college and yeah it wasn't you know I mean I guess I guess what could a flip phone do <laughs> I know I know I know they were not fun to, to text on. So <laughs> yeah, it wasn't anything exciting. No, not at all. Um, well, let, I want to talk about a million praying moms because yeah. I was like looking for that on your profile. And yeah. I was like, where did that go? I swear she had a business. So tell us what that was. Yeah. So um, about 12 years ago. 12 years. Um, wow. I know. I know. This is like ancient. It was right. Um, well, my old or my middle is going to be. 14 this summer and I started blogging like two months after he was born and because I had quit I had quit teaching then and that's just what people did then totally (laughs) you started a blog then like it was like scrapbooking Uh or whatever and a couple years into that I um, started kind of seeking out women that were raising boys um, and we kind of formed a group to encourage one another in raising boys. And um, it was called the Mob Society at the time. And I had connected with a woman in Virginia named Brooke. And we started a blog and a business called the Mob Society at the time for mothers of boys. And uh, that just kind of snowballed. And um, we were putting out resources for helping moms praying for their boys and um, encouraging them about this is normal. This is what it's like encouragement, all that type of stuff. And, uh, a few years ago we, uh, converted it into a ministry for all moms and called it million praying moms. So it was just, um, really a foundation of going to prayer first for your kids rather than using it as a last resort. Mm. (laughs) Like, yep. Um, and so, 
Uh, yeah, that was 12 years of doing that. And it was, it was wonderful. Brooke is an amazing woman and um, an author and we had a podcast and everything. And I would say probably um, about two years ago now, I just felt um, a calling from the Lord that I needed to be more present in my boy's life and in our um, family and locally um, more plugged in with our schools and our neighborhood and our church. And um, I kind of drug my feet a little bit because having a business with someone for a long time, it's hard to leave that. And even though I knew it would be a good thing. Um, and so I, I drug my feet for a little while, <laughs> for about a year and a half. And this summer, I finally let her know that I just felt like this was what I needed to do was to step away from that to be to be more um, local uh, and in meaning my family, church, community, all of that. So I stepped down at the end of October, totally amicable. Um, I know uh, that Brooke was still feeling led to um, keep going with Million Praying Moms and she is exactly the person to be doing that. And I knew that God had already put some things in my life here that I was supposed to be doing. And I was trying to do that and keep up with the, with the business and all of that. So, um, I, I, I say I had to learn to let go of a good thing Mm. for what is good right now, what is better and best from, from him. So, um, yes, I stepped down from that at the end of October and that's been weird. Uh, like (laughs) that's just been part of who I am for as long as I've stayed at home. And so, uh, uh, a weird transition, but also, um, very confirming that it was the right thing to do. Just being able to volunteer, um, in ways at the boys schools and to get more plugged in at our church and be in, in small groups with women and speak to some women's groups around here. And, and all of it just feels like this is right. And part of it was, um, having done online ministry for so long, I kind of forgot how much I needed to be with people Mm. in person. And um, I had a friend when I told her that that's that I was stepping down. She goes, this makes so much sense to me because I I've always known you were a people person and I couldn't understand how you were happy doing this all online. And I was like, I didn't realize it. (laughs) Why didn't you say something? Um, But now I I see that like I, I am definitely filled up by being with my family more, by having coffee dates with friends, by serving on this board at, at the school and, and volunteering in those ways. Those are the connections that I need. And um, yeah, it's, it's a transition, but it, it's the right one. And it, it just goes to show that you don't always have to leave things because they're bad. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like this was something that was still really good and a great relationship and a great ministry, but it was just not right for me anymore. Gosh, that's such a hard decision. Yes. There were a lot of tears. I mean, because it's like, not to say it's easy to leave something when it's bad, but you can like justify it in your head real quickly. Like, obviously I'm leaving. This is terrible, but when it's good, but you know, it's time. It's like, and like you created it. Yeah, with, yeah, with that, Brooke. Right, that made it even harder, and that's why it took me like a year and a half to find. I can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, I think about that a lot with my podcast too, which is one reason, even though um, this podcast is not like financially lucrative at all at this point. This is like a labor of love. I hired someone to help with it because I was like, you know what, like if I'm putting so much time and energy into this that like it's taking away from my family or like my, you know, like my energy, what I have to pour into them, why am I doing it? You know? And so I was like, it doesn't matter about the financials or anything with that for this show right now. I want to continue doing it. It feels like the right thing to do, but I have to find a way that it is not totally zapping me because what, what I'm doing is, I want to encourage other moms. I want to encourage other dads and parents through this podcast. But if I'm like sucking like what I have to give to my own family from doing it, 
I'm doing it wrong. So yeah, you know, just like a month ago, I hired someone to, to come on and help me book guests and things like that. And, um, it already feels like, okay, this feels already feels more right because of that, but it's hard to justify those things sometimes. So I think it's important it that we like are constantly reevaluating. Is this working still? Right. And I also, sometimes I have hesitated to talk about it because it's not a judgment on anyone else and right. their decisions. Right. And so like, it's really important for me to say like, doing online ministry, it did fill me up for a while until God showed me that it wasn't. And so if it's what, if it's what fills you up, if it's what brings you joy, if it's doing your thing, and for some people doing their thing is like managing accounting books for, you know, whatever that would suck the life out of me and I would hate it forever. And you know, yeah, it would be totally. awful thing. but, um, like, there was, there was a lot of joy in what I was doing and all that. It's just that at this time, this is what I felt called to do. And that's not a judgment on anybody else. So like when you're hearing somebody's story and you're like, oh, well, they left their job mm -hmm. so they could be more present. Like, actually, I left it because I was supposed to be investing my talents in like our church and, mm -hmm. and volunteering at the kids schools, not because work is bad yeah, or not because something was bad. And so I feel like moms can get in that guilt when they hear somebody else's story of like, Oh, is that what I'm supposed to be doing? Right. And it's like, no, <laughs> unless, unless that is where you're being led and you feel it, somebody else's story is not your story. This is just mine. And I would say that I am equally as busy now with other projects, but they're more of what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And they're, they just fit my life right now. And I, and it feels, it feels right. It feels like where I, this is where I'm supposed to be using my talents and my, and my strengths. So good. Get in tune with your mind, everybody. Um, yes. I, okay. We didn't talk about this before, but I'm a huge um, personality tests, uh -huh. like strengths finder, Enneagram, Myers-Briggs person. And I'm always like talking about like, you have to like know who you are and what you're wired to do and all that. Otherwise you're going to burn yourself out, you know, wasting it on things that like, I am not, I am not good in this area, X, Y, Z, you know, and maybe I need it to function, but if somebody else could help me with it because they're good at it, that would be a better use of all of our, our skills. <laughs> what are you on the Enneagram? I'm a seven. Okay. I think that's what I am too. Yeah. I'm so I'm all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Same. Same. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like, everything is exciting and interesting and, and I want to do it all. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm, that's me. <laughs> for, for sure. Hey friends, a quick break here to let you know that the Donna Marathon weekend is coming up. This is a race I do every year. I missed it so much last year. It is held in Jacksonville, Florida, the weekend of February 5th and 6th. The half marathon and the marathon is Sunday, February 6th, so it's coming up. There's also a 5K on Saturday, February 5th, as well as a one-mile kids run. We're actually bringing our whole family down to Jacksonville for this year. We're having a meetup on Saturday the 5th. Would love to meet any listeners there. If you're nearby at all, get in the car and drive over to Jacksonville and check out this race. If you register for the race, breastcancermarathon.com, use the code LINDSAY10. That will save you 10% off any of their races. And then you can head over to visitjacksonville.com and you can plan your whole weekend around the race and find all sorts of other fun things to do in Jacksonville. Jacksonville has more than 250 days of sunshine a year, and there's plenty of opportunity to lace up your shoes and hit the trail, park, and beach. Jacksonville has over a thousand miles of shoreline, more than any other city in the state, not to mention 22 miles of white sandy beaches. It is just so beautiful down there, and I cannot wait for this race starts and finishes on the beach. Again, go to visitjacksonville.com to learn more about the city and go to breastcancermarathon.com 
to register for the Donna Marathon weekend. I'm doing the half on Sunday, February 6th. Would love to meet you. We're also going to have a meetup in the post-race tent as well. So lots of opportunities to connect. Breastcancermarathon.com. Use the code Lindsay10. Grab a couple friends. Come down and say hello. All right. Back to my conversation with Aaron. Um, Okay, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up is like teaching our kids uh, to do service work and like volunteer and things like that. And like, you know, (laughs) just yesterday I was like, okay, guys, what are your hopes and dreams for the new year? Like, what are your goals? And, and, you know, and anytime they do a lemonade stand, I try to be like, we're going to donate 10% to charity. Like, I just, I try to instill it, but like, it feels like I'm talking to like the wall, like they don't really care. And, um, I interviewed Dave Thomas from Raising Boys and Girls. Oh, I love, yeah. Isn't he great? And one of the things he really, you know, I really like focused in on from our conversation was that with little boys and kids in general, but he was specifically talking about boys is that like, don't try to have these big, long conversations and like explain all these things. It's got to be like short and concise and like side by side time where you're not like sitting there face to face, like trying to explain all these things. And I want to do all these like, this is why we do this. And, you know, you know, all these things. So anyway, basically it boiled down to like, they want to go to more trampoline parks this year for (laughs) 2022. Um, And I was trying to go a little bit deeper, but I'm just curious now that your kids are a little bit older, like how have you talked about um, like giving back their time and resources and what they've been given to other people? Yeah, I understand your um, feeling there. It's like talking to a brick wall when you have these. My kids have said to me before, mom, that was a lot of words. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because I like to talk. Sorry, kids. Um, But uh, okay, so this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It is easier to direct them in that area when somebody else is motivating them to do it than me. Mm. And um, we've had so many conversations over the years about how should we help? How should we do this? All of that. The biggest thing that happened for us in the past year, well, one, when they get in high school, our school has service hour requirements. So it's kind of like, well, I'm not making you do it, but, but they are. And so that was that was one big thing was having them involved in something that requires service hours kind of forces them into finding something they would like to do in ways they would like to help other than me saying it, Mm -hmm. which, you know, mom's talking a lot again. So, (laughs) you know, all that. Um, The second thing is at our church, they encourage every age group to what they call serve down. So high schoolers, they encourage them to serve like a couple days a month in either the middle school ministry or in the kids ministry. Middle schoolers, they encourage them to to volunteer in the preschool area. And they talk a lot about how, what an impact you have being just, a gen, just that much older than them, how much they look up to you. And that has been the biggest thing in our family. Like before that, my older two were not you know, serving in kids church or doing anything like that. And they both love it now. And it, it wasn't me telling them it was their, their leaders at church saying, Hey, we want you to serve down because you're investing in the people coming up behind you. And I can tell you that, especially for my oldest, he has really enjoyed it. He told me that he has grown a lot because of it, you know, and having to like teach younger kids. He said, you know, this made me understand it better myself Mm. and, and want to be better myself when you're being an example for someone underneath you. And also I've heard such great stories from the kids, parents and stuff like that. And so once you get that snowball rolling of what it feels like to help other people and serve other people, then it kind of naturally flows. Like he, he wants to serve now. Like it's not, oh, I have to go this week. You know, he'll get a text and say, somebody's sick, can you fill in? And he's like, yeah, I want to, and and do that. So the, the outside influence is a big part on it. I wish I could say that I magically inspired them to volunteer and help in some way. But honestly, having outside influences 
that inspire them to want to has been the, probably the biggest thing for us. And the other part, you know, you said the lemonade stand thing. Um, we had a good friend of our oldest when they were younger that had diabetes uh, type one, and they wanted to do a lemonade stand for him. So finding something that's like a really personal mm. connection, mm -hmm. you know, some, some organization that's really close to their heart. Our middle one wants to be a vet. So anything like pet related or our, we have a really awesome zoo here. Those things have been things that he really wants to get involved in because it's what his passions are. So outside influences and things that are connected to their heart have been the, the biggest help in plugging them into areas where they want to serve. I think that's so smart too. It really like just circles back around to the conversation about moving your body too. It's like yeah. they have to lean into what is natural for them and like what yes. they enjoy and not yeah. forcing things and Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like, oh man, you want to save the world, but like, what do you, what are you good at? What are you passionate right. about? And where can you lend those services? And you can't, you can't think about everything. You just gotta, right. yeah. Cause that gets <laughs> yeah. overwhelming. It does. And I think you want to fit the mold of other families yeah. or other kids and you can't do that. You have to do what's natural for your family and for your, for your kids. All right, Erin, I hate to wrap up, but we have to do it. Um, oh, I know. is that, is the million paint brain moms podcast? Like if, is it still going and can people find your yeah. old episodes? Yep. Yep. Million praying moms on wherever you do podcasts. And I know that, uh, they're starting a new season I, this month on joy, but all of our old ones are on there. I think, we, I know we have one with Dave Thomas on there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've been friends with him since the beginning of our, you know, the 12 years ago, he's, he's a great one always. Um, but yeah, they're all there. Million praying moms, uh, and uh, lots of encouragement and we hit lots of different topics. Awesome. <laughs> so, okay. I'm, I'll have to look at those topics. That's, that sounds yeah. exciting. Um, okay. What is something professionally or personally that you would like to do that you haven't done yet? Well, uh, I have not been to New York city. Really? Ever. I have never been there. We were supposed to go in 2020 to run the marathon oh. and then everything shut down. It was supposed to be our 40th birthday trip, like oh. in between our birdie, birthdays, but we deferred to this year. So 2022 is the year that I'm going to New York City and running the New York City marathon. So good. I kind of want to run. I'll have to run for charity if I run because I don't have a bit. But so like I'm I'm running for charity. My husband got in on time. Okay. And I'm running for charity. So that is What charity are you doing? I'm I'm doing Team for Kids. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm excited about that and I love I love what they're doing and um we we knew we wanted to run the same year yeah. and I didn't get in on the lottery, so that's how we made it work. I mean, it is hands down the best marathon I've ever ran. It's I can't wait. So fun can't wait. It is. It is like, I mean, I've run Boston three times. Like I've run probably 17 marathons. This is by far the best marathon I've ever ran. Oh, well, I know. Um, so we did Chicago in 2017 and I loved all the people on the course yeah. and I did the same thing about multiply New York. It, so. Multiply yeah. it. It's going to yeah. be even better. <laughs> it's so fun. I'm excited yeah. for you. Okay. What's the best, most recent book you've read? Um, so I, uh, I'm in the middle of a book called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone mm. by Lori Gottlieb. And it's a therapist's memoir who about her therapy, herself, and her patients. And it's super fascinating. Like, it's just goes into a lot of interesting stories, but it also talks about, like, what the purpose of therapy and how things are approached. And I didn't think that a book about that topic would be so fascinating to me, but I am loving it. I cannot remember whose podcast I heard her on, but I heard her on someone's podcast and she's fun. She's, she's good. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's going to bother like, me. Like a memoir about therapy does not sound fun, but it is. It's like, it's like, what? Like that kind of stories in it. So yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. Um, I've heard of it. Okay. What's your, uh, do you have a kid's book or like a teen boy or whatever age book you recommend? Okay. For littles, our favorite is the book with no pictures. Okay. BJ Novak. So funny. Laugh out. Yeah. Laugh out loud. So funny. And then, um, for probably like 
th- third grade up, depending on reading level. Um, and I read it and enjoyed it as much or more as them at their different levels. But all of us have read it now is The Wing Feather Saga by okay. Andrew Peterson. Okay. It's four books. It's very like fantasy and adventure. Um, but it's also just like lovely and wonderful. I, I, I want to read it again. It's about family with hidden magical background and it's, it's wonderful. It's four books. Uh, I would say, I think our youngest read it in third grade, but our older didn't start it till like fifth or sixth grade. Cause it hadn't come out yet. And then I read it as an adult and we all enjoyed it equally. Did you like read it together or did you like nope. read it aloud to them or just all separate? Nope. You just wanted just, to know what yep, they were reading. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I had heard such good things about it from other parents that were like, I read this cause I wanted to know what they were reading. And I ended up loving it, falling in love with it. So, Oh wow. Okay. I love yeah. that. That's so it's, great. It's fabulous. Um, do you have a trip or somewhere that you've gone with your family that you recommend? Okay, we love traveling, so this was really, really hard for me. But I would say if your family has not done Yellowstone, it's amazing. It's perfect for just about any age level. It does take, you know, a while to get there. So that's probably the limiting factor with younger ones. But once you're in the park, like all the like things to see are not like super far to hike to. And there is so much variety in one park in what you can see from like geysers and paint pots and hiking and it's just it's amazing it's great for adventure and beauty and animals we saw bears there like I mean just everything it's it's one of my favorite all-time trips we have to go. We have to get out west. We haven't done anything do. really out west with the kids. I think we, we, Sandy is still in diapers for some reason because <laughs> I am lazy <laughs> and I don't want to deal with it. But like when I have no diapers, I want to do a trip yeah. like that. So um, if you go out west, Rocky Mountains was our first national park trip when our youngest was four. Okay, so, so maybe that's yep. the starting point. Okay, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Um, what is your last message to leave with the audience today? Um, I I touched on this before, but basically be a student of yourself and of your kids and know that even though they all came from you, they're not the same and you need to really study them and know what makes them tick and know yourself well and base all of your parenting and family decisions off that and not what other families look like. What a perfect way to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. I could talk for hours, but this was great. Hey friends, thanks so much for being here today. I am so grateful you are spending time with us. I hope you took something from this conversation with Erin, just like I did. That conversation filled me up for the entire week and I cannot wait to do it again. You all can find Erin on Instagram. She is home with the boys over there. You can find me personally on Instagram. I am Lindsay Hine 626 You can find this podcast, Why Is Everyone Yelling, on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about the Sandy Boy Productions podcast network, hit up sandyboyproductions.com. You can sign up for our newsletter where you will get the show notes from every episode delivered to your inbox so you don't miss the books we suggested or anything we talked about. We always write all that up in the show notes and that can be delivered to your inbox. Um, You can also email my production assistant, Emma, Emma at sandyboyproductions.com if you'd like her to just add you real quick to our newsletter. Okay, friends. Thanks for being here. Happy January. We're doing it. Have a great rest of your day and we will see you next week on Why Is Everyone Yelling?